Today's scripture reading is Romans 8, 26 through 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God, God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of God? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. God's message for us this morning is about what it means for us to be more than conquerors and how we get there. Obviously, we know what it means for soldiers to be conquerors in battle. And those of us who've never served in the armed sources have a sense of what conquering or winning means in other types of competition like athletic events. I know that a lot of you are 12th men or 12th women who support the Seattle Seahawks. A lot of us are Cougs or Huskies or Vandals or Eags. And of course, I'll always be a Texas Christian University Horn Frog, and some of you have been joining my team recently. Football season's just around the corner, yay. And baseball season is nearing an end with our Seattle Mariners hanging in there with a few more wins than losses and a chance for playoffs. Before we know it, Gonzaga will be back on the court and we can pretty well count on being winners there. I don't hear many people in the church talking about pro hockey, but that may change now that the Kraken has been released from the depths of Puget Sound and has had a good year. And some of you are supporting children and grandchildren who are competing on sports teams, some in bands or dance teams. And those events are fun, and it's particularly fun to be on the side of winners. Go teams, go, fight, win. For victory is thrilling, and defeat is agony. May our teams be winning teams and give us thrills rather than agony this year. But of course, sports and even wars between or within countries are not 
the only kind of conquering and not the kind that Paul is talking about here. Paul was just using an image that the Romans could understand. Paul is talking here about Christians conquering sin and death through the love of Jesus Christ, pure and simple, to a degree. He doesn't mean we won't suffer. He doesn't mean life will always be easy. We will have challenges and suffering and heartbreak in our lives. Some of our beloved church folks, friends, and neighbors are struggling now with illnesses and are in treatment or are facing surgeries. Many of you have experienced incredible loss in recent years and in recent months, and we keep praying for miracles, but it's hard when health concerns mount. So how do believers conquer those forces that would seek to destroy them? In Romans 8.26, Paul says that the Holy Spirit helps us in our time of weakness. The Spirit is always strong and is always there to walk alongside us and guide us and counsel us and teach us. When we don't know how to pray as we ought, the Holy Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep words, scripture says. And Paul goes on to say that God who has searched us and known us knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit in accordance with God's will. I don't know about you, but this verse is very comforting to me. Even pastors don't always know how to pray as we should, especially when we or our own family members are suffering deeply. There are just times when we have to go to God in silence and trust that the Holy Spirit is interceding and God knows our needs. Besides, it's important for us to spend quiet time with God and just be still and know who he is and listen for what he says to us. As the summer gets hotter and drier and windier, our soil and our plants thirst for rainfall. And likewise, when we go through the hard times, the wilderness journeys of our lives and the dark nights of our soul, we need God. Psalm 42, 1 says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Sometimes words are not enough. Sometimes we have no words at all. That's when the Holy Spirit takes over with those sighs that are too deep for words. That's when the Spirit intervenes for us to be filled with the life-giving waters of God's love and promises. Paul assured the Christians at Rome and today's believers that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. How comforting is that? This is Paul saying, it's all good if you love the Lord and are in his will. It's interesting to note that in some translations, the scripture says, God works for good in all things. It looks to me like there's been a lot of debate about what the original language said, and many think that God should be the subject of the sentence. I don't know. I think that's what this promise means, no matter how it's worded. I think this is a verse we should memorize. It reminds me of the scripture verse that is printed on practically every graduation card I've ever purchased, Jeremiah 29.11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, and plans to give you hope and a future. God gives salvation and glorification to those believers whom he calls, and he makes us like Jesus, his son, and part of the family. Last week, we read in this same chapter of Romans verses. 14 and 17, that all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. In a sense, we are adopted 
by God the Father, and we are brothers and sisters of Christ Jesus. In verse 31, we find another great memory verse. If God is for us, who is against us? The point is that God is more powerful than anyone or anything that could separate us from his love. If God gave his son to die for us, surely God will give us everything else we need to. Jesus will intercede for our sins. He who carried our sins to the cross and died that we might be forgiven is the only one who could condemn us, and that just won't happen. God's purpose is for Jesus to intercede and save us from sin and death. And there's no way we can be separated from the love of Christ. No, no way, no matter what. There are more memory verses in 35 and 37 through 39. Eat your hearts out. Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. Paul adds that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. We could add a few of our own, like COVID-19, cancer. MS, forest fires, grass fires, windstorms, earthquakes, floods, heartbreak, the death of loved ones. None of these things, none of these sorrows can separate us from Christ's love because in all these horrendous things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We come out winners no matter what, because of God's grace and pardon and gift of everlasting life. Paul says we aren't just winners. We are more than winners because in our God-given victory in Jesus, we are blessed beyond measure. We learn from our trials and hardships and our tragedies are turned to the joy of God's design. And besides all that, remember that nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of Christ. This is how the version of the Bible called the message, words, verses 31 through 39. So what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? And who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's chosen? Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, it, is he in the presence of God at this very moment? sticking up for us? Do you think anyone's going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? No way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, and even the worst sins listed in scripture, none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Our victory is in Jesus the Christ, our Redeemer and Lord, and we are more than conquerors in him who loves us and from whom we are inseparable. This is God's promise for those of us who are loved and are called according to his purpose. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And amen.